Hello calculus students. We are now doing a review of integrals. Our first objective is to find a function whose derivative is below. So notice that this here is an f prime of x, not just f of x. And we're trying to figure out what f of x is, uh, whose derivative gives us 5x squared. Now, one option, and there's going to be many answers to this if you recall, but we know that when I do a derivative in a power situation that the power drops. So I know that the original function had to have an x cubed as its uh, original power. And if I just stop here and then test it, we're not going to get 5x squared as the derivative. We're going to get 3x squared. So I know I need to put some sort of a, a constant here in front so that when I do 3 times that number, the result is 5. So you're essentially saying, hey, 3 times what will give me 5? Well, the answer to this question is just going to be uh, you know, 5 divided by 3. In other words, 5 thirds. So let me get rid of that question mark. Here we go. And we know that 5 thirds needs to be the coefficient. So this is a function whose derivative is 5x squared. Now I said there's going to be many answers to this. Another possible answer would have been uh, f of x equals, you know, I can just copy this and put any tack on at the end, any constant I want. 5 or 6, right, or 1,000, right, all of these are acceptable answers. And so the most general way to write the antiderivatives of a function is to just put a plus c out here. This is called the uh, general antiderivative, and it really is a class or a family of infinitely many possible answers, because c could be any real number, positive or negative or zero. So if ever you're working with a, a derivative and you want to go backwards and find the antiderivative, then there's going to be infinitely many answers if there's one. If there's one, there's infinitely many. Okay, so this next slide has us review some basic ideas about uh, antiderivatives in the context of calling them indefinite integrals. So when you see this phrase here, indefinite integral, we are referring to the fact that there's some sort of function and uh, surrounding that function is what's called an uh, integral sign, which is like a elongated S, and then a differential, a dx in this case. And this notation, when you see it, you want to find the antiderivative of this function. So pretend like that function is a derivative. Even though you don't see an f prime there, I can still call a derivative just f of x, as long as you think of it as a derivative. And our objective is to find a function whose derivative will give you f of x. Uh, now, in the last slide, I presented the derivative with the f prime, so it was sufficient just to say the antiderivative was f, but without the prime. But when the derivative is presented without the prime, like it is here, just integral of f of x dx, then a common thing that's done to express the antiderivative is just to go uppercase. So, of course, this is not a specific example. This is a general idea that the when you see an indefinite integral of a function, it's representing this family of antiderivatives. And then now we're going to make that derivative connection, where if you were to take the derivative of capital F, you would get this little f that's over here between the integral sign and the dx. By the way, the, this position right here is called the um, integrand. I'll write that word in a later slide, but the function there is called the integrand. So the integral of an integrand produces a, a family of functions whose derivatives all are equal to the integrand. Now in this next example, this is the integrand is it's a, a constant, just a k. So if you're doing an integral of any constant, then the antiderivative would be that constant times x, right? Because the derivative of a constant times x is just a constant, is, the, is that coefficient. But then of course we need to say plus c. So the integral of a constant is you just add tack on an x to the constant multiply the constant by x. Uh, this next one, uh, there's a constant times of a function. In the case of differentiation, you could ignore the constant and just differentiate the function. So in the case of anti-differentiation, it makes sense you can do the same. So we can effectively ignore the constant k and instead narrow the integral down to the function itself. And that's about all I can really write for this line. But this is just communicating the idea that you really just integrate the f of x, get an answer, but then multiply your answer by that k. Right, we could have done that uh, up here with this problem. I could have effectively ignored the 5 and just thought about, hey, what's an antiderivative of x squared? And that would be x cubed and a third. Right, because when you differentiate this, you get x squared. 
But then you remember that there's still a 5 there. So you do 5 times a third of x cubed. In other words, you have 5 thirds, right? The same thing that we have here. Uh, this next one is, or the integrand is a summer difference of two functions. So that When you integrate this, you can integrate term by term. Just like when you differentiate a summer difference, you differentiate term by term. Integration is the same. So you could integrate the f of x and then close that integration by putting the dx and then the plus or minus and then integrate the g of x and then close that integration. So you can just integrate term by term, as I say. Uh, the next case, what happens, how do you anti-differentiate x to a power? Well, we know that this is the reverse power rule, or the power rule for integration, is that the, if the power was n in, in the integrand, then the antiderivative needs to have a power that's one more than n, so n plus one. And then if I just stop here, and this function here, when I differentiate it, will not give me this one because the n plus 1 would drop down and become a coefficient. Right? This n plus 1 would become a coefficient, and there is no n plus 1 here. So we need to put a, a constant in front of here that will counter that. And throwing a 1 over n plus 1 in front does, does the trick. Right? Because this n plus 1 will multiply to that fraction. It will multiply to the numerator, and you'll get cancellation. You'll get n plus 1 over n plus 1. They cancel, leaving a 1. And then the power drops from n plus 1 to n. So this will work, and then we put plus c. Now this rule works for every n, any, any number here works, this formula here works, except for one case. Uh, because when you're dividing by n plus 1, you have to be careful that you can't ever divide by 0. So what value of n would make that 0? And the answer is, if n is negative 1, this would be a problem. So we have to put in this, uh, this clause here that this n, or this formula works if we assume that n is not negative 1. Otherwise, we have a problem. So we address the negative 1 power as a, as a separate case, this case here. And if you recall your derivatives very well, you know that to get... Well, keep in mind that this is the same thing as just 1 over x, right? x to the minus 1 means 1 over x. And so when you're looking for an antiderivative, you're trying to find the function whose derivative is 1 over x. And if you know your derivatives well, you should know that it's natural log of x. The derivative of natural log of x will produce 1 over x. Now, there's one extra thing that needs to be remembered here when you anti-differentiate 1 over x. Right? If you have the integral of 1 over x, then the only restriction on this x is that it can't be 0. 1 over x is a well-defined expression for every other x except for 0. But natural log of x is only defined if this x is positive. And so we go from... If, if I say natural log of x is my antiderivative, I lose certain values of x from my domain. Because in the original integral, x can be positive or negative. But in my answer, x can only be positive. And that, that restriction that gets added onto my answer is uh, not ideal. But the way to uh, get around this issue is to actually have this x in absolute values. It, it can be shown that the derivative of natural log of the absolute value of x is also 1 over x. Like the presence of the absolute values on that x in this case do not affect the, the derivative. So the derivative of natural log of x and the derivative of natural log of absolute value of x both yield 1 over x. And so this is a, a nicer expression for antiderivative because now we go from a situation where x can't be 0 to a situation where that's still the case. 0 is now the only issue with this antiderivative. x can be positive or negative because the absolute values will make it negative before the natural log happens. So this uh, no change in domain happens here, and then we just need the plus c. All right, let's go to the next column here. Uh, the antiderivative of e to the x is just, again, e to the x, right? Because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So antiderivative keeps that the same, and then put a plus c. Uh, antiderivative of cosine is sine, and then plus c. Just verify that, right? Differentiate sine, and you get cosine. So that works. Antiderivative secant squared, that one's tangent. Derivative of tangent is secant squared, so check. Uh, the antiderivative of cosecant cotangent, uh, this was the cosecant. The derivative of cosecant, ooh, there's a catch here. The derivative of cosecant is actually negative cosecant cotangent, not positive cosecant cotangent. So we need to put a negative here on our antiderivative so that when I differentiate, you know, now if I differentiate negative cosecant of x, I'll get positive cosecant cotangent. Uh, then a couple more here at the bottom. If you recall from your derivatives, the derivative of arctangent of x is what gives us 1 over 1 plus x squared. 
And the last one is the uh, antiderivative of the hyperbolic sine is the hyperbolic cosine. No negative needed because the hyperbolic sines and cosines differentiate back and forth without any negatives being produced. Right? The derivative of cosh is cinch. This list that we just have on this slide is not all inclusive. It's just a, a little slice of some basic antiderivatives you should be very comfortable with. All right, let's look at some uh, more examples here. The antiderivative of each of these. So applying our, our rules, I can effectively ignore the 2 and just really focus on, hey, what's the antiderivative of x to the 7? So the 2 stays, and then I use the reverse power rule. We get a 1 eighth x to the 8th. Right? We increase the power from 7 to 8, and then we put a 1 over that new power in, in, as a coefficient. And then I'm going to simplify this. The right because 2 times 1 eighth winds up being a quarter. So we get 1 quarter x to the 8th plus c. Okay, next one. Uh, this one's just illustrating here that we have a sum. So our, our integrand, which is right here, is a, is a sum of two different functions. And we can integrate term by term. So I can just do an antiderivative of the constant. Well, to anti-differentiate a constant, you just tack on an x. Then we anti-differentiate to x. Well, that antiderivative will wind up being x squared. Easy to verify. So you just integrate term by term. And then when you're all done, you can just put a single plus c at the end of it. Uh, in this case here, before I do a, an antiderivative, I'm going to do a little bit of what I call prep work. I'm going to rewrite the integral by bringing that up as x to the minus 2 to get the antiderivative. I'm going to employ the uh, reverse power rule. So it's going to be x. We increase this power. Some people like to accidentally put negative 3. And the reason that is is because they ignore the negative and increase 2 to 3. But you actually need to start with negative 2 and add 1 to that. When you take negative 2 and add 1 to it, it becomes negative 1. And then you need to put a 1 over negative 1 up here in front, which really just is, that's just negative 1. And we need the plus c now because we've done an antiderivative. Uh, and then if I were to, you know, rewrite this, it'd be a negative coefficient, and then x to the minus 1 becomes 1 over x. So this is really just negative 1 over x is the antiderivative function, and then plus c, any constant. And this uh, last one on this particular slide, do a little bit of prep work here as well. I'm going to rewrite that square root of x is x to the 1 half, and then just do the reverse power rule. So we add 1 to 1 half, right? so we have to do 1 plus 1 half, get a new power. So we need the thing that is 2 over 2, and add those together, we get 3 halves. So we have the new power is 3 halves, and we need to put a 1 over that new power in front. And then I don't really like this fraction within a fraction, so I'm going to go ahead and invert and multiply. 1 over 3 halves is the same thing as 2 thirds, and here's a good way to leave our answer, although you could... Uh, do this one half power part anyway, and think of that as a radical again. So you could write this as two thirds radical x, but that's being cubed. Perhaps that three still needs to be there. It's just the one half part of that power that makes the radical. I would say you know any any of these is is a good place to stop. Okay, let's keep moving forward. You'll notice that. Let me back up a little bit. You'll notice in our uh, there isn't a anti derivative rule for a product. So looking at the current problem that we're on, I definitely see a product here, right? I see something times something. We cannot, be careful, you do not just anti-differentiate this and then anti-differentiate this, right? This is a common mistake people do is they'll say, okay, the antiderivative of the first part is this, parentheses, antiderivative of the next part. Uh, this is 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. We just did that and say, oh, there's my answer. I'm done. This is a mistake. You anti-differentiated two factors of a product. We cannot do that. We cannot anti-differentiate piece by piece when we're looking at a product. So the kind of prep work that needs to be done here is, well, distribute. Let's make this so it's only a sum and not a product any longer. Uh, 4x cubed is the first term, plus, and then we have x cubed times radical x. Well, radical x is x to the 1 half, so I'm going to actually combine those into one power before I go any further. So I'm going to do a little bit more prep work. The first part I'm going to leave as it is. But here, in this case here, we have to add the powers, right? So we have to do a 3 plus a 1 half is going to become the new power. Well, instead of 3, I'm going to write that as, you know, 6 halves and add that. So 7 halves will be the new power here. And I've finished my prep work. I'm now ready to integrate term by term, one at a time. So the very next line is where the antiderivatives are going to happen. And I, I like to do prep work, even though this first part was ready one step before this part in my prepping. I like to do all the antiderivatives at the same time. It helps with the notation, keeping it clean. So now let's just do an antiderivative of 4x cubed. Do the reverse power rule. The 4 stays. The new power becomes a 4. But then we divide by that new power, so that would just become a 1. We don't need to write it. 
we get just a nice x to the fourth, right, is the antiderivative of 4x cubed. Plus, and let's do an antiderivative, we have to take 7 halves and add 1 to it. Well, 1 is the same as 2 halves, so adding 2 halves to 7 halves because it's 9 halves. So the new power is going to be x to the 9 halves. And then we have to do, put a 1 over 9 halves here in front, but I'm just going to go ahead and invert that right now as 2 ninths. And then plus e, and this is a good place to stop. This next example over here to the right also requires a little bit of prep work ahead of time. I'm going to split the x up. A common denominator, or a single term in a denominator, can be split under each part of the numerator, under each term of the numerator. And then those can be individually simplified. I'm actually going to leave the, the or think of this as 3 times 1 over x. It's a good way to think of 3 over x. Minus, and then x to the 5 over x becomes just x to the 4. Uh, the 3 is going to stay, and the antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of absolute value of x. Don't forget the absolute values. We had that comment earlier. Minus, and then the antiderivative of x to the 4 is x to the 5 with a 1 fifth in front. And we are done with that one. Definite integral. A definite integral is not the same thing as an indefinite integral. The definite integral is obvious because it has limits of integration involved, and it has a, a very different meaning, in fact. So let's go ahead and identify some of these. Again, the f of x is called, the function that's here is called the integrand. That's the same word I was using for the indefinite integrals as well. Uh, the dx here is called the, that's the uh, differential. Uh, the s, right, is the integral sign. And then the a and the b are called the lower and upper limits of integration. And these are all the different components of a definite integral. Now the meaning of a definite integral, symbolically it represents uh, something related to area when this function f is graphed. So let's look at three different possible cases. Uh, in each case, I'm going to put the lower limit as the left x-coordinate and the upper limit as the right x-coordinate. And generally the upper limit is a larger number than the lower limit. Although that doesn't have to be the case, we'll talk about that uh, later. So in this case here, the function is this uh, blue curve here, we'll call that f of x. That gives the graph of that, that curve, that's the top of our boundary. And the amount of area here is what is represented by the definite integral. So let's say this area, I'm just going to make up a number, let's say this area wound up being uh, 5 square inches. Then our integral, if we do a definite integral from a to b of this function, it would give us a positive 5 as a result. Let's look at case 2. In case 2, let's say that uh, our function is now below the x-axis. Oh, I should have specified that this other horizontal line involved is the x-axis. Um, here is this blue curve is the function in question, its graph. Again, let's go with the limits of integration. Or a is smaller than b is bigger, so it's to the right of a. And let's pretend that the amount of area in this case here that you see here is uh, 2 square feet. Well, when you do an integral of this function from a to b, when you, a definite integral in this case is going to give us a, an area, but it's going to give us a negative version of that area. So this is going to yield a negative 2. When the function is below the x-axis and you integrate that function from left to right endpoints, you get negative results. And in case 1, if the function is above, you get positive results. But they're both related to area, right? This 5 is related to an area. It's, it is the area. And this uh, negative 2 is related to area. It's the opposite sign of the area above. Now what happens in case 3 when you have a function that's partly above and partly below? So again, we have uh, a to b, our x limits. This line here is the x-axis. And then the, the blue, again, is the function. But it's partly above and partly below. Let's pretend that uh, the amount of area above is uh, 1 square meter and the amount of area below is uh, 3 square meters. So a definite integral in this case, where the function is part above, part below, is that you're actually going to get a cancellation. You're going to get positive areas combined with negative areas, and then whatever the end result is. So when I just say, hey, what's the integral from a to b of this function, we're going to get all areas that are above, which will be positive, and then remove all areas that are below. So the end result of this one would also be negative 2. Okay, uh, so that's what the, the meaning of the definite integral is. Uh, find the exact areas of the three differently colored regions. Let's go green first. The amount of area is represented by an integral. 
from x coordinate 2 to x coordinate 4. So these are your lower limit of integrations, x equals 2, and your upper limit of integrations, x equals 4. And we're going to integrate the function. We'll say that this is area of region 1, and then we need the differential dx. Okay, now this particular function was given to us. We know what it is. It's right there. So let me go ahead and actually put that in there instead. So we have 2x minus 1 half x squared. You can put this in parentheses and then the dx, or often for laziness sake, we just don't write those parentheses. So this is the integral that is uh, represents this area. And I know that the answer is going to be positive because the function happens to be above the x-axis. Between x equals 2 and x equals 4, the function is up, is up here, right? It's above the x-axis. Now, we're going to employ what's called the fundamental, or a portion of what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it turns out that a way to calculate this area is to find an antiderivative of this function and then plug in 2 and 4 into those into the antiderivative and, and subtract. You actually plug 4 in first and then plug in 2 next and subtract. So if I were to come back up to here, the general notation for calculating a definite integral is to find some sort of antiderivative of little f. Remember, I'm using capital F to stand for an antiderivative. And then I put this vertical line next to it with a and b. This is called an evaluation line. It just means plug b into the antiderivative and then plug a into the antiderivative and subtract. So the next line would read, now whatever the antiderivative is, plug in b and then minus, and whatever the antiderivative is, plug in a. Right. This is, this is uh, the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus that allows you to uh, find the value of definite integrals by using antiderivatives. I'm going to find an antiderivative uh, so I do an antiderivative of 2x, well that's x squared, and this I will put in parentheses, and then an antiderivative of negative 1 half x squared. Well it's going to sub stay subtraction, it's going to go to x cubed, and so I need to do a 1 third times this pre-existing 1 half, that will give me a 1 sixth. Right, so there's my antiderivative, close the parentheses, put in the evaluation bar, and then a 2 and a 4, and then what we do is we plug the 4 in first, and then we plug in the 2 in the second, and we subtract. Okay, so we plug 4 in first. We get 16 minus, well, 4 cubed is 64, and 1 sixth of 64 doesn't really simplify nicely. Um, but we, it's 64 sixths, which does boil down to 32 thirds. I'll leave that to you to verify. So there's the results of plugging in the 4. Put it in parentheses, then minus parentheses. I'll plug in the 2. So we get a 4 to begin there, and then we get an 8 sixths, which is four thirds. Now the second set of parentheses is, you know, this set right here, parentheses is super important because of this subtraction that's right there. Now we can distribute this negative across there and combine and see what we get. So we get, uh, this will be 16 minus four, so we'll get 12 to begin with, and this will become plus four thirds, and we have a negative 32 thirds already, so that's gonna be negative 28 thirds. And then if I insisted on getting a common denominator, uh, I'd have 36 thirds minus 28 thirds. That gives me 8 thirds total. All right, so there's an answer for the uh, area of this first region. It's 8 thirds units, square, un square units, whatever the units are here. I never specified. Also notice our vertical scale and horizontal scale are not consistent. So our answers might feel wonky because I'm not using consistent vertical and horizontal scales. But the area 1 has an area of 8 thirds. I do want to take a quick moment and show you how you do, can do this on Desmos, at least the integration. And here in this uh, line, you can type in i and t will bring up an integral. And our integral went from uh, 2 to 4. So 2 at the bottom, and then go up to there and put 4 at top. And then here, start some parentheses. Put your integrands in parentheses when using Desmos. And then type in uh, using the keyboard dx at the end. So this Desmos is a, will do the integral for you. And if you want to see it in fraction mode, just hit this fraction button. It's here on the left side here in, in the blue. So confirming our answer of 8 thirds. I think I'm just going to use Desmos to speed up the process to get the other answers here. That's why I wanted to show it to you. Let's do the red one next, actually. Let's call this um, area 2. To find this area, uh, let's set up the integral from uh, x... You know, the x-coordinate negative 2 to the x-coordinate negative 1 is where the, the window for the red portion. So we're going to integrate from negative 2 to negative 1. Let's call this area 2. 
And then we put the function in there, which is uh, 2x minus 1 half of x squared dx. And I'm not going to repeat all the work we did above, but I could. Let's just go to Desmos and type this in and see what we get. So the only thing that's going to be different is I need to change my limits of integration. That's going to be a, a negative 2 at the bottom, or a negative 1 at the top. Okay, notice it's giving me an answer of negative 25 sixths. Well, why is it giving me a negative number? I'm after an area. I would like a positive number as an answer. But well, the reason we're getting a negative result out of this integral is because the function is below the x-axis here. If I really want to get a positive answer as a result, then I have a few options for doing this. Because I, I don't like this statement the way it's currently written. Because the left side stands for an area, but the right side is giving me a negative number. In areas, we, we don't think of areas as being negative in general. If I'm just after how much space is taken up by the red region, then I want a positive answer. So we can uh, correct this easily by putting a negative in front of here. And then we're going to get that a positive 25 6 right, as an answer. So if you go back up to here and you put a negative in front, you, you'll get that uh, positive answer that you're after. Another way to uh, guarantee that an integral that you know is going to produce a negative, but you want it to produce a positive, if you recall that a, a negative of a definite integral, that negative could be absorbed into the integral by switching the limits of integration. So I could write it this way, instead integrate it backwards and get the positive 25 six. Right. So coming back here to Desmos, you know, put a negative one at the bottom and a negative two at the top, right? That's another way that guarantee I get that positive result out of the integration. Uh, but just so you know, as a third option, you could say, hey, don't integrate this function, but integrate its absolute value. You know, flip the, flip the, which has the effect of flipping this graph up here into the th third quadrant. So you'd be integrating this and finding this area, but they'd be the same area. It's the exact same shape, but just reflected. So you, you could take this approach as well, but we don't know how to integrate by hand a, a function that has absolute values. So when I say, hey, integrate this by hand, that's where it gets tricky. But the technology can do it. So if I come back to this here, and instead of parentheses, I'm going to put absolute value signs, but put the function in absolute values, and this will work too, right? We had 2x minus 1 half of uh, x squared, and then put the dx outside the absolute value, right? and then put this in fraction form. Yes, yeah, so we get our 25 six this way too. The technology can handle when you put an absolute value sign on the function. So that would have been another way to, to resolve this. But in our work here, let's go ahead and leave this in parentheses and put a negative out front. This was one way to get our positive 25, 6. OK, now finally, the third region, the blue region. The blue region is actually composed of uh, two different areas. So let's say uh, this one here is area 3 and this one here is area 4. So we want to actually come up with a way to get these two areas combined so we get a total area. What I don't want to happen is a cancellation of areas, like is what does happen when a function crosses the x-axis, and you don't take that into consideration. Like if I wanted to get a total area, in this case 3, the answer would be 4, right? Because there's 1 square meter above and 3 below, so the total area would be 4. But if I just integrate the function from a to b, I get negative 2. So how do I get that 4? Well, the way to do this is to figure out where it crosses, and then find the two areas separately, and then combine them later. So that's the method, the approach we're going to take here for this, the blue, is I'm going to find area 3 and area 4 separately. But I'm going to set this up as a sum. So area 3 plus area 4 will be equal to. So to find area 3, we need to do an integral from negative 1 to 0. Right, 0 is where the function crosses, right, at, at x equals 0. And we integrate the function, which is 2x minus 1 half of x squared dx. But because the region is below the x-axis, the function on this region is below the x-axis, this will give me a negative result, this integral. And I don't want it to give me a negative result. I want it to give me a positive. So I put a negative sign in front of that, and that should fix that. This now gives me area 3. And then to that, I'm going to add an integral that will give me area 4, which is an integral from 0 to 2. And then the function again. This time, though, for this region, the function is up here, right? It's above the x-axis, so I don't need to put a negative sign. Integrating from 0 to 2 will give me a positive area, as I expect. 
So this, this should uh, set us up nicely to get the total area. And I'm just going to use Desmos to get it. A couple things you can do here to, as, as some sort of shortcut, you could do the, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to create uh, a function here. I'm just going to call it f of x. And I don't care about seeing its graph. Let's just hide that. And now I have something to refer to. So I can do the following. I wanted to do the negative integral from negative 1 to 0 of the function f of x. And then we need the dx. Okay. And let's make a fraction out of this. So this 7 sixths that we're getting here is the actual, that's what area 3 alone is. Right? So I just typed in this integral effectively, and that's just this part. In fact, you can even do something like this. You can put an a with a 3 after it. It says a sub 3 equals. So you can store these things separately. So I can, uh, tell me I can copy that. Good. Done. So I just copied that and made a new integral. Call this a sub 4. In this integral, we did not need the negative in front, but we did want to integrate from 0 up to 2. All right, so 8 thirds is the uh, area 4. This is actually something we could have surmised because uh, parabolas are symmetric, and this is the graph of an upside down parabola. And so area 1 and area 4 are symmetric regions. And so we already found that area 1 is 8 thirds, so I could have just guessed or known that area 4 would also be uh, 8 thirds. So we got 7 6 for the first uh, for area 3 and then we got 8 thirds for area 4. Now we want to combine these together. All right, using uh, Desmos now you can just say, "Hey, what's um a 3 plus a 4?" And give me a fraction version of that. 23 6. And there's our answer for uh, the blue region, which is actually two pieces combined. Something you can also do when you're trying to find the total area and the function has crossed the x-axis. I'm thinking blue region now, right? So if I wanted to find the area of just all the blue stuff put together, uh, you can also do this with a single integral instead of two, like I've done here. But it requires the use of absolute values to do it. So if I were to uh, go over here to Desmos and do uh, the following integral, you can integrate over the entire region. So from negative one all the way over to, to two. And then the integrand will be the absolute value of the function. And then put the dx at the end. And notice this will give me a total area of 23 thirds that I'm after. So that's another option you can do when you have technology at your disposal to integrate an absolute value. If you don't have that, then you're going to have to integrate by hand by doing it in two separate integrals like I've done here. Okay, uh, that's uh, everything from our review of integrals.